Let's talk about the soaring battle host of Red, Gold and Black and see what our Sons of Sanguinius can unleash in 10th edition. Time for a full review of Index Blood Angels. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're continuing in the review of Space Marine Indexes. I've just done the Dark Angels so let's move on to the Blood Angels and see what their counterpart Angels of Death can bring to the table. Throughout 9th edition they hadn't been having too bad a time of it. Basically a powerful chapter rule and the sanguinary guard data sheet kind of carrying them to do okay for most of the edition. They perhaps fell on some slightly harder times towards the end of 9th though. Iron Hands and Dark Angels perhaps being a bit stronger competitively. It's going to be fun to see how the forces of Sanguinius shape up in 10th. They're always really quite a dynamic and destructive army to play. Very aggressive, but maybe not too hard to kill when they're exposed. Here's a quick summary of the contents of Index Blood Angels. As per Dark Angels and the rest, we don't get the Space Marine Faction rule reprinted here. Oath the Moment is still their major army-wide rule, though you have to look in the Codex Space Marine datasheets for that. Instead, in Index Blood Angels, there's the Sons of Sanguinius Detachment. As with the Dark Angels, only Blood Angels chapter-specific units are allowed here, though you can use any of the generic datasheets from the core index. The detachment rule is a melee buff called Red Thirst. They get 6 stratagems, a lot focused around melee damage and combat, and 4 enhancements for characters. The Blood Angels appear to have 19 datasheets now. Looks like they've only lost the one in the Sanguinary Ancient, but the standard Firstborn Death Company datasheet has been split in two. With the Blood Angels, it looks like at launch they'll have the choice between using their launch detachment or the Gladius Task Force. No obvious restrictions that prevent their unique units from using that. Perhaps the buffs aren't quite as melee focused, but I feel like having access to really quite easy advance and charge is no bad thing for the Blood Angels, could certainly help out. At time of recording, we are still waiting on points. We won't really know what's good or what's bad competitively until they come out, but we can certainly get a very strong idea as to how the army works and will be put together. For the faction special rule, as with the rest, we have Oath of Moment. Select your target and get 4 rerolls to hit and wound against it, either at range or in melee. As mentioned previously, really quite a strong damage buff for the Space Marines. I feel that like for Blood Angels in particular, it might be quite handy for anything that you're thinking about charging with Sanguinary Guard with their strength 5 and damage 2 melee. With the absence of a plus 1 to wound on the charge normally, it will be quite big if you can get those rerolls. I feel like it might be a rule that's just a little bit easier to coordinate with ranged units as opposed to combat units though. With combat units, you might well be failing your charge against the thing that you oathed. Though I guess the potential rewards if it does come off and you get a dangerous melee unit into a key target could be pretty massive. Getting into the actual meat of the index though, the Sons of Sanguinius detachment is the Blood Angels launch detachment. As kind of expected, it feels sort of balanced and fairly aggressive combat Blood Angels. Nothing really too specifically aimed at either Death Company or Sanguinary Guard. It could well be that they come with further detachments whenever their codex comes out. I'd also say that in terms of rule support, the Blood Angels perhaps seem to be worse than ever in terms of movement support options and delivery things for their combat units. It was a bit of an issue with their 9th edition codex, but in this they've also lost the plus one to advance and charge, the option to fall on Fury Death Company, and the Sanguinary Ancients boost to movement of jump pack units. All of that's going to mean that it's not quite as easy to get your jump packs into combat. As per the rest of these launch detachments for the specific chapters, you can't use any unique units that aren't from Blood Angels, Kind of makes sense. You can run the entire force just with generic Codex Space Marine datasheets painted however you want, I suppose, but you wouldn't be able to add in things like, say, Adrax Agatone of the Salamanders or Gilliman of the Ultramarines. Starting with perhaps one of the most headline things of the detachment, the Core Blood Angels launch detachment rule appears to be the Red Thirst reinterpreted. Plus one strength and plus one attack when your unit makes a charge, but you don't get any damage buff if the opponent charges you now. This is basically replacing the plus one to wound and the plus one to advance and charge. And I guess compared with the other detachment, it's in place of the Gladius detachment's combat doctrines. In terms of the damage buff, I feel like it's somewhat equivalent to the plus one to wound. The plus one attack is really quite nice, general and solid. That'll pretty much always help out in your combat. The strength thing though is either going to be really big or completely useless. Perhaps most likely to make a difference against things that are either toughness four, toughness five or toughness six. But often if you get plus one strength against a really tough vehicle, it's not going to change the wounding bracket. Overall though, it does seem like a good rule. Blood Angels will still be hitting harder on the charge than any other Space Marine chapter basically. And I guess it really favours aggression, you making the charges, as opposed to allowing your opponent to come to you in any way. I feel like the plus one to advance and charge loss will be felt though. Deep Strike charges will be a lot less reliable if you're making them at a nine inches, not an eight. And the army will just be a little bit slower to get across the board in general. 
Stratagems next, and the Blood Angels have six of them. First up, we've got the return of Angel Sacrifice. Previously, this one was one to sacrifice a character and basically have them tank damage for the rest of the squad. Now, though, it's been reinterpreted as when the character actually dies, the rest of your army gets a permanent damage boost against the thing that killed them. For the rest of the game, if you spend this command point when a character is killed, the entire rest of your Blood Angels army can then re-roll the hit rolls against the unit that killed them. It does seem like a potentially good damage buff if it's going to be relevant on a big scary enemy unit. I guess it does have a bit of an overlap with Oath of Moment, though. If you're still going to put Oath on that target unit, then it's going to be a bit redundant. A little bit on the situational side, but might be useful on occasion. From the core codex, we've got Armour of Contempt. This one's the same as the Gladius Strike Force, and the Dark Angels get this too. A reactive durability stratagem, way worse than the AP of enemy attacks by one. Quite nice against AP-1 or AP-2 attacks in particular. I feel like for the Blood Angels, it will actually be really quite a relevant stratagem. Sanguinary Guard and Death Company don't have invul saves, and when they lost Armour of Contempt, it was quite painful for them. I feel like particularly for the Sanguinary Guard, with their 2 plus save and no invul, Armour of Contempt will be very solid for extra toughness. At range, it will be competing a bit with Go to Ground, though in theory you could stack them if you're getting very spendy. Next up, we've got another small situational utility one that actually lets you have a little bit more fight phase and charge phase shenanigans. Aggressive Onslaught is one that you use when you consolidate, and basically provided you can end an engagement range of an enemy unit when you do consolidate, you'll get to consolidate up to 6 inches rather than up to 3. A lot of the time it's just not really going to be a big deal, but occasionally it could be quite massive. Sometimes it will just be that 3 inch gap between either just killing the enemy unit and standing completely out in the open, or consolidating into an enemy squad and tying them up for the next turn. If your dangerous jump pack unit killed one unit and then consolidated into some infantry with heavy weapons, they'll potentially not be firing. Could be relevant for objectives as well if the opponent's on one of those, or maybe even keeping the unit safe if they get to consolidate into something that's in cover or out of line of sight. I feel it is a little bit situational, a lot of the time it's just not going to be something that's important, but it seems like something that you could potentially plan for. For one command point, we also have Red Rampage, which feels like it's a very predictable extra damage increase. You trigger it when your units are about to fight, they get lethal hits, so auto wounds on sixes, and they also get the Lance keyword as well, so that's plus one to wound on the charge, back from before in the Blood Angels rules. Again, I feel like the plus one to wound is probably the good bit, and this really doubles down on the detachment rule. You're already decently better in combat when you're on the charge, and now this will make you ridiculously so with the plus one to wound as well. In general, this is really going to be the one that you want to go for if you're wounding on a 5 plus or worse, though it's still very solid even if you're wounding better. Say if you had some Sanguinary Guard going up to Strength 6 on the charge, they're wounding a Toughness 11 vehicle on a 5 plus, this will give them an effective 87% damage increase between the auto wounds and the plus 1 to wound, really quite massive. If you're wounding something that would say Toughness 6, this would be a 50% damage increase, which is still pretty massive for one command point on elite melee troops. Overall, I feel like this one is going to get played really quite a lot in this detachment. Provided you don't think you're just going to wipe out the unit anyway, this is one command point that you can trade for a whole load of extra wounds off your enemy target. Otherwise, the Blood Angels also have access to Only in Death Does Duty End. This one's another copy and paste style one from the Gladius, two command points to fight in death. A bit of a pricey one, but basically guarantees that your dangerous combat unit will get to fight this phase, whether or not it happens to be that your opponent can't quite kill them, or they take a whole chunk of the unit down and they get to fight anyway. Perhaps a bit of an alternative to combat interrupting if the opponent is just going to go first and wipe the unit. Again, definitely could be worth it with the amount of melee damage Blood Angels Assault units can do. Finally, for one command point, we've got Relentless Assault. This one's fall back and charge. You can't fall back and shoot with this one at all. Maybe some slightly White Scar style combat shenanigans there that Blood Angels didn't used to have access to. Again, like quite a few of the other ones, this feels like a bit of a handy situational one that isn't maybe one to build around too much. Throughout the course of the battle, I'm sure there will be units that wind up getting locked in combat after the fighting's done. A lot of the time it just might not necessarily make sense to leave them there, as your opponent might be striking first. This one could allow, say, the last one or two sanguinary guard in the squad to fall back out of that unit, and then maybe charge something else minor of the enemies to inflict some actual meaningful damage, rather than just falling back and then proceeding to do nothing. Even if they just fell back and then recharged the enemy unit, provided nothing nasty happened to them like Overwatch, it could just flip fighting last to fighting first, which could potentially swing the combat. Overall, I feel like most of these are usable, but maybe not use every turn type ones. Red Rampage maybe seems like the most directly reliable, that's pretty much entirely within your control. Maybe Armour of Contempt as well, if it's going to make the difference between some Sanguinary Guard living or dying. 
Only in death does duty end as well, again it's quite a nice one. If the enemy is a fairly combat heavy army, it could mean that you basically get to take one of their units down with you when they charge one of your squads. Next up we've got 4 enhancements for your characters, unfortunately the librarian dreadnought can't take these as he's not an independent character anymore. Artisan of War sort of feels like an alternative to the Artificer Armour from the Gladius Force, a save of 2+, plus, but instead of getting a feel no pain type save, it gives you better AP on your combat weapons. Seems like an okay personal character buff to me, maybe okay on something like a Gravis Captain if you're going for foot marines. I think the extra AP on something like an AP2 Power Fist will be worth it against a fair few foes. The Visage of Death is one that allows you to halve the objective control of models in the enemy unit, I guess that sometimes might be useful. You do have to be in engagement range and presumably not have killed your targets. I feel like it probably is going to be quite rare that this actually makes the difference between whether or not you win or lose an objective though. I feel like a lot of the time one unit will kill the other one or either you or your opponent will just win the point regardless irrespective of whether or not this rule existed. I can't see this one being super popular to be taken. If it's super cheap though it doesn't seem like the worst to have on a bounding assault unit jumping towards the enemy. Next up we've got the new version of the Archangel Shard, this one's a relic blade but it can be applied to any combat weapon it would seem, it gives your melee weapon the lance keyword for the plus 1 to wound on the charge, really quite a nice damage boost when stacking with the plus 1 strength and attack. Seems good on power fists, you'd be wounding most infantry on a 2 plus with that, even tough ones, and be wounding most vehicles on a 4. It also gives the unit anti-chaos 5 plus as well though, a bit of a curious combination there as that's rarely ever going to come into effect, only relevant if you're wounding on a 6 plus anyway most of the time. I guess it's kind of useful if you needed critical wounds for something though, with something like a thunder hammer it means the mortals will go off on 5s as well as 6s, which I suppose is quite nice. I feel like the lance keyword really is the main value of this one though. Finally we've got the icon of the angel, this one was previously a charge reroll, now it's a fall back debuff, this one means that enemy units must pass a desperate escape check if they want to fall back, usually having a 1 or 2 to slay each model in the enemy unit, and they get a minus 1 penalty to that test if they're also battle shocked as well. This one again does seem a pretty nice one to have on aggressive assault units going towards the enemy, there are going to be times where your opponent absolutely wants to fall back from them, otherwise they're just going to get killed in combat, this means that a bunch of them might well get killed regardless. I think out of these ones I probably prefer the two on this page here, the plus 1 to wound for the character and the icon of the angel, obviously how good they are will depend on final points costs, but plus one to wound is just quite a nice character melee buff, and punishing enemies from falling back from a Blood Angels unit does seem like really quite a good use of an enhancement. Overall I feel like it's an interesting detachment, the main rule definitely brings a fair bit of raw power, though as mentioned I do really feel like in terms of movement tricks and actually delivering Blood Angels into combat, it just doesn't really help out all that much. I guess at least when you are engaged, a few of the enhancements and stratagems could be pretty disruptive, things like fall back and charge and extra consolidation and things do seem kind of cool. Will be interesting to see whether or not this one works out better than the Gladius Force for the Blood Angels. As mentioned, easy access to advance and charge I think is a really big deal. It does seem very scary on Blood Angels units, even if they might not be hitting quite as hard once they get there. Moving on to the Blood Angels unique data sheets now, and it seems that most of these have survived pretty intact. Again, like some of the other Space Marine unique characters, I was kind of expecting a few of these to get removed. Some of them, like Tycho, have been removed from the web store and going by the precedent of things like Yarrick or the Chaos Lord with the Jump Pack, often when things get removed from the web store they just go completely. Seems that units like Tycho and Gabriel Seth have survived for now, though I still think that there's a reasonable chance they might not make it into the Core Blood Angels Codex whenever that comes out. I suppose it's guaranteed to be no earlier than Summer 2023, so these miniatures have guaranteed got a fair bit more play in them, even if Games Workshop did choose to remove them and send them to Legends at a later date. Otherwise it looks like the forces of the Blood Angels have gained one data sheet and lost another. Seems that the Sanguinary Ancient has been rolled into the main Sanguinary Guard Squad once more, so the banner will actually be part of the unit and not running around independently. And the Death Company data sheet has followed the same trajectory as the Assault Marines and the Vanguard Veterans from the Core Codex, having the option for a data sheet with jump packs and one without. I feel like the Sanguinary Ancient won't be missed too much as being part of the squad, it means that the Sanguinary Guard will actually be fielded in units of 10 models again if you want them to be, and seeing as that plus 2 to movement relic is gone, perhaps one of the best things that he did in the previous codex has been made a bit redundant anyway. One common datasheet rule that's been reinterpreted is the Black Rage, quite relevant for a whole load of Blood Angels who are very angry at Horus having killed Sanguinius. This one's been reinterpreted a little bit, it still gives you the 6 plus feel no pain type save, but now rather than getting yet another extra attack on the charge, instead you get reroll all hits on melee, 
often going to be even more relevant, and particularly on things like thunder hammers. The downsides of the Black Rage are now only applicable if you're not within 12 inches of a chaplain. It's going to make things like Lamartes and Astarath particularly nice for leading death company units. If they're not near chaplains, then their objective control becomes zero from one, and they also can't be selected to fall back either. Not that I guess that's usually going to be something that they're going to be desperate to do, but I suppose it could be worth it if you're using that fall back and charge stratagem. Overall, definitely doesn't seem too bad for death company. Seems like, if anything, that's a small damage increase there. Going into the data sheets proper, and let's start out with the Blood Angel squads, then we'll talk through vehicles, generic characters, and finish up with named characters. Starting out, we've got the boys in gold, the Sanguinary Guard, definitely been carrying the Blood Angels for pretty much most of 9th edition, perhaps a codex with some slightly lackluster rules that have been really helped out by one enormously powerful data sheet for how much they do for what it costed. The Sanguinary Guard are now in squads of 5 to 10, and they count as an assault squad for jump pack characters attaching to them means that they can be joined by things like captains, chaplains and librarians with jump packs from the core book, plus plenty of the unique Blood Angels options of course. They've definitely got a whole load of choices for character support. Stats wise, they perhaps aren't enormously changed. They're now 4 attacks base with Shock Assault rolled in, hitting at strength 5, AP-2 and damage 2 with their Oncarmen blades. It does look like the axe and the sword have been rolled into the one profile. Pretty much the sword profile, but AP getting one worse, which is kind of common throughout 10th edition. Otherwise, they still move fast, have their 2 plus save, and they kept their minus 1 to hit in combat as well, so are a little bit harder to kill there. Otherwise, for datasheet changes, looks like the Power Fist is only 1 per 5 maximum now. Could be interesting to have a couple of those there to help threaten tougher stuff. And for their ranged weapons, the Bolters lost range and AP. Just 2 shots at strength 4 now, though they picked up Pistol, so you can fire them in combat should that be relevant. The Inferno Pistol has also been toned down a little bit as well. It's still a 6 inch range, close melter punch. Strength 8 and AP minus 4, but it's only damage D3 now rather than D6, though it kept the Melter rule too. Means that if you're within 3 inch range, you get an average of 4 damage out of that thing. Though often, to be honest, if you've got into 6 inch range, you often can get into 3. Still pretty dangerous for a little pistol sidearm. Otherwise, they've got a couple more special rules. The Sanguinary Banner, if you take it, gives them plus 1 objective control, which is potentially fairly powerful. They are the sort of unit that's going to be jumping forward and striking for the opponent's units, and if you can just be a little bit better defended on objectives while you do so, then so much the better. If they happen to be with your Warlord as well, then they've also got a minus one to wound if the Warlord leads those units. That only applies in melee, just like the minus one to hit. Previously, if they were within six inches of your Warlord, they got a plus one to their hit rolls. It seems that that's become Dante's main rule now, and isn't just a core datasheet rule. Finally, I would say that they've probably had a bit of utility taken out of them by losing their big heroic intervention stratagem. That was definitely something that made them yet more threatening, with the chance they could just jump onto you if you tried to go too near them on objectives. Overall, I feel like they still seem good, maybe just a little bit less general purpose without the plus one to wound option that they get, but they're still going to be hitting at strength six on the charge with five attacks at damage two, which is definitely powerful. That plus one to wound stratagem seems excellent, and the two plus save is perhaps a bit more useful in 10th edition when there's less massive AP going around everywhere. Really good choice for support characters as well, which I think could be interesting. Next up, and also one of the more important units, are the Death Company. As mentioned, they're now a separate unit with the jump packs or not with the jump packs. The main difference is, is only really in the special rules, otherwise they're pretty similar. You get 5 to 10 models in the squad, they're leadership 6, so they aren't quite as bad as they used to be now. And in terms of character attachments, they count as a tactical squad, and that does mean that they're going to be really quite flexible once more. A lot of options for firstborn characters. Perhaps one of the biggest reliefs for Death Company is they still seem to have unrestricted access to as many Power Fists, Thunder Hammers or Power Weapons in the unit that they want. I was kind of a bit apprehensive they might just have their weapon options drastically cut down, and just have a fairly underwhelming generic melee weapon as their profile. I'm guessing Mass Thunder Hammers is going to be significantly more expensive, but they still seem massively interesting for the Death Company, even though they hit on a 4+, plus, as Death Company have that Black Rage rule for full rerolls to hit. Otherwise, they've still got the option of taking Bolters, um, pistols like Hand Flamers, Inferno Pistols, or Plasmas, and their unique datasheet special rule is called an Honourable Death in Combat. If the squad's taken a casualty, then you get Sustained Hits 1. If the unit's below Starting Strength, then it gets Sustained Hits 1. If it's below Half Strength, then it gets Sustained Hits 2 so they're punching massively hard at that level, and when you get to sustained hits too, it means that you just may as well re-roll all the hit rolls and fish for those sixes. It means that even one lone death company all by himself will be enormously dangerous for the foot squad. Overall, glad they've got a decent access to melee weapons, 
Could be interesting jumping out of a transport maybe as an alternative to the ones on jump packs. That damage buff rule is quite nice if it gets triggered. Otherwise and generally tending to be a bit more popular are the Death Company Marines with jump packs. Rules wise they're basically the same squad, obviously going to be having a higher points cost but they get fly at a 12 inch move and deep strike built in. You can still load them up with thunder hammers or power fists or keep them cheap with chain swords. They get the black rage for the full hit rerolls and then they trade out the on foot death company rule for one called berserk fury. They don't get extra damage when they get depleted but they do get two reroll charges innately. Really quite a nice thing for just getting a bit more reliability going into combat. Quite good out of deep strike and might save your CP. They do look like a really interesting unit for jump pack characters to lead. Blood angels are kind of spoiled for choice between these and sanguinary guard. Everything else in Codex Space Marines only has the option of the Vanguard Veterans and Assault Marines, where you can't give everyone damage to weapons should you want to. Still look pretty interesting, they will definitely make a mess when they hit combat with the Stacking Blood Angels rules. Finally for our third flavour of Death Company, we've got the Death Company Intercessors. These guys are fairly similar in stats to the On Foot Death Company, they still got the same amount of attacks with the Chainswords and everything now. Though of course as the Intercessors kit they're a lot more limited, they either have chain swords or bolt guns, and it's only the sergeant that gets a fancy fun melee weapon. They do count as an intercessor squad for character attachment, so it could be kind of interesting for other Space Marine Firstborn characters, particularly ones from the core book. I guess you could have them with a 4 plus invul save for a librarian, for example. Otherwise, for the data sheet, I guess they can't focus on using their bolt rifles quite as well as regular intercessors, as they don't get the assault keyword or the heavy keyword that the regular ones do. They're just literally two shots out to 24 inches at AP minus 1. Perhaps the most interesting thing is their datasheet special rule though. Visions of Heresy means they get to either use a free Overwatch stratagem or a free Heroic Intervention each turn. Heroic Intervention is going to be a bit situational, but Overwatch is something that you're usually going to be able to trigger and just fire off a few bolt shots towards the enemy unit, provided nothing else in your army wanted to Overwatch this turn. That does seem pretty amazing value if you're not using it elsewhere. You could even have a Primaris Lieutenant in the unit it would seem and have those Overwatch attacks land on lethal hits. Again though they might just wind up being one of the Space Marine units that kind of falls down the cracks a bit, just a little bit overlooked compared with fast moving, hard hitting direct damage units like the actual jump pack death company. Let's talk through the Blood Angels vehicles next, and first up we have the Furioso Dreadnought. Much like the Codex Dreadnought, he's gained toughness 9, a 2 plus save and 8 wounds at the expense of his duty eternal minus 1 damage. Most of his weapons aren't enormously massively changed, the heavy frag cannon has gained rapid fire for an extra d6 shots for really quite big volume fire at 9 inches, but not too much change beyond that. It's a bit more of a counter attack weapon really, I think it will be hard to deliver into 9 inch range with a movement of 6 otherwise. The Furioso Fists and the Furioso Talons have been changed a little bit. The Talons give you 7 attacks at strength 8, AP minus 2 or re-rolling wounds, and the pair of Fists if you take it gets 5 attacks at strength 12, AP minus 3, again re-rolling all wounds. Generally, if you're fighting against a toughness 9 or better unit, then generally the fists are going to win out. If you're fighting against lighter things, then the talons make more sense. The magna grapple gives you a plus 2 inches to charge against monsters and vehicles, but you would have to trade out your smoke launchers for that, and that is a fairly decent defensive stratagem. I feel like that's perhaps something I could go either way on. This guy's definitely the sort of unit that's got slow movement and is likely not to be able to jump from cover to cover, so will probably be eating enemy fire. Finally, his special rule is called Wrathful Rampage, Gets the chance to deal some mortal wounds before he fights, roll a d6 and add 2 to the result if he charged, 4 or 5 for d3 mortal wounds, a 6 plus for a flat 3. Certainly doesn't hurt, might just be a tiny chance that he kills enemy units and he gets unable to strike in combat, that would be a bit sad if so. Overall looks kind of interesting, but I still feel that the combination of moving pretty slowly and having close range weapons isn't going to do him any favours. The Death Company Furioso though I think does look a little bit more interesting, Perhaps in no small part due to having a movement of 8 inches, really quite good for a dedicated combat dreadnought. It's also a little bit tougher with a 6 plus feel no pain from Black Rage, though I suppose it might be a bit more awkward keeping him in chaplain range I suppose. He has to take the pair of melee weapons, can't take the frag cannon, and rather than dealing just a few extra mortal wounds in melee, he gets a rather brutal unique special rule called Frenzied Rampage. Basically literally every time that this dreadnought gets attacked, he gets to either shoot or fight against the enemy. After your opponent's unit has shot the Dreadnought, after all the models have resolved their attacks, he then gets to shoot something if it's in range, potentially blaze away with some heavy flamers against some infantry units closing in on him. A lot of the time that might not be very relevant, there might be no units within 12 inch range, but if so that could be pretty massive, 
and it would be a bit of a feel-bad moment if your opponent didn't know about this, say chucked a grenade at the Dreadnought, and then is kind of surprised when it just turns around and barbecues their entire squad. It's pretty spooky in combat as well. If the enemy charged it with multiple units, it could potentially swing multiple times per fight phase, and I believe if you charge the enemy, failed to kill them, and then they made some weak attacks back that don't really hurt it, I believe you'd get to fight again. Might be that I'm missing some subtleties of the rule, but it just looks like it's immensely dangerous, and your opponent really needs to try and make sure that they kill it dead as soon as possible, if they don't want it to keep on acting out of turn. Looks pretty interesting, far more interesting than the regular Furioso, I think. For Space Marine Vehicles, we've got the Trusty Bar Predator with either the Twin Assault Cannons or the Flamestorm. Like the other Predators, it's gone up to Toughness 10, 11 Wounds and a 3 plus save. Needs some really dedicated anti-armor weapons to gun it down. Weapons-wise, the Flamestorm Cannon is kind of similar to the Lamb Raiders. D6 plus 3 shots at Strength 6, AP minus 2 and Damage 2, and an 18 inch range with Torrent and Ignore's cover. Fairly effective against standard Space Marines. I feel like this one might actually be looking a little bit better than the Twin Assault Cannon now. Now it's swapped out the 12 shots for Devastating Wounds and Twin Links. The Assault Cannon definitely will chip away at things, but it's going to be a lot less efficient against Light Infantry that it's wounding on twos. Could be interesting enough for an aggressive Overwatch unit as well, if it loads up with a Flamestorm and Heavy Flamers. If the opponent moves within 12 inch range of that, then it's barbecue time. Its special rule is one called Overcharged Engines, now it looks like they're actually a little bit more useful. This one allows you to re-roll the advanced roll, so it should be somewhat guaranteed a fairly decent result there. And then it can also go on to advance and shoot with all of its weapons, provided it only targets enemy infantry. I feel like that's perhaps a little bit of a weird restriction, but kind of feels like it's carving out a battlefield role for itself, moving very quickly and then mowing down squads with flamers or guns. Will be interesting to see if it's enough to actually have it see play a bit. I feel like the Bar Predator has the unfortunate job of competing against the rest of the Space Marine Codex generic day sheets for Blood Angels range support. For most armies, they take the majority of things melee, and then just a few select ranged units. The Bar Predator has to be really, really good to stand out in competition. Finally, for the Blood Angels motor pool, we've got the Librarian Dreadnought, which appears to be more classified as a vehicle now as opposed to a character. It is missing the character tag from its keyword section. It means that it can't take enhancements and it's not going to be getting any sort of lone operative type character protection or anything like that. It is going to have to live and die on its own defensive profile. It is at least a bit tougher, bar duty eternal at least. Toughness 9, a 2 plus save and 8 wounds. But still not really all that hard to kill if you point some dedicated anti-tank at it. I feel like there's really quite a lot going on on its datasheet though. Plenty of quite cool things. It strikes as it normal attacks with the Furioso Fist. 5 attacks at strength 12 and damage 3, and then also backs it up with a further attack with his force halberd as well. A single attack hitting on a 2 plus with strength 9, but a huge damage d6 plus 3 if it goes through. That one does look pretty intimidating, though I guess it might struggle to wound the toughest vehicles. Otherwise, it also gets a single very very powerful shot at range as well. Seems this librarian dreadnought is now carrying around basically half the sanguinary discipline. It can strike with blood lance at range, a single shot at strength 12, AP 3 and damage D6 plus 3 if it overcharges, and if you do look out and roll A6 on the hit roll, then you get an extra D3 hits on top of that. That's truly quite a powerful anti-tank shot there, if that goes through it's certainly going to get felt. You could kill an enemy dreadnought in a single roll if he got lucky. Then it's got two further psychic powers. Shield of Sanguinius kind of feels a little bit like the psychic hoods that other librarians have. It's an aura buff for Adeptus Astartes units within 6 inches, it gives them a Feel No Pain 5 plus ability against psychic attacks and mortal wounds. I think that is quite nice in an aura. There are plenty of scary psychic attacks out there, say for example an enemy blood lance, and mortal wounds are certainly fairly common with things like devastating wounds. Finally, and perhaps one of the most interesting things of all, is Wings of Sanguinius. I'm afraid this is no longer a daft flying dreadnought anymore, which was kind of fun, but it has been reinterpreted as basically Space Marine version of Dad Jump for the Orcs, taking Astartes infantry unit within 12 inches, Roll a 2 plus to avoid taking some mortal wounds, and if you do, then the infantry unit jumps over the board and gets set up anywhere 9 inches away from the enemy. Kind of feels not so very different from things like On Wings of Fire from previous stratagems. Being able to redeploy across the board is really quite cool. It could be good just to get some guns on line of sight of the enemy, or perhaps with Blood Angels no doubt having a good chance of making a charge and trying to get into combat. There are a few ways that you can get plus 1 to your charge roll, so for example an attached champion, it could still have a gamble as an 8-inch charge. Looks really quite interesting. I feel like the stuff it does is quite cool. Probably biggest risk, though, is just if it gets shot down and targeted early in the game. I'd imagine it's going to be fairly points-intensive and quite a big deal if it lives or dies. 
Moving into generic characters for the Blood Angels, and next up we've got the Sanguinary Priest. His damage and defensive profiles remain pretty unexciting. He can't take the Teeth of Terror anymore to liven things up, I'm afraid. And he can join the Assault Squad, Devastator Squad, Tactical Squad, and Vanguard Veteran Squad. All of the on-foot versions, particularly interesting perhaps for joining the Tactical Squad, as he can join on-foot Death Company, and perhaps in particular the Devastator Squad, unlike any of the other Firstborn data sheets from Core Codex Space Marines. It's a bit weird, that one. For his rules, he grants his unit a 5 plus feel no pain type save. That's really quite handy on any of these. It will help the death company, though maybe not as much as most, as they already have a 6 plus one. I guess could be kind of cool for some shield vanguard veterans, maybe. But whatever squad he leads, he also makes the AP and melee an extra AP minus one better. I guess particularly good for the vanguard veterans and death company there. Overall, looks like fairly decent buffs. Could be interesting enough. Could be interesting enough for foot melee options, or even being able to use an enhancement on the Devastator squad, maybe out of the Gladius task force. I feel like perhaps the jump pack version, though, has a little bit more interest in what units he can join. Speaking of which, the Sanguinary Guard with jump pack still seems to exist. He can join assault squads with jump packs and Vanguard veterans with jump packs, and that does mean that he can join the Sanguinary Guard and the Jump Death Company as well. Overall, I feel like both of his buffs just fit very nicely with Sanguinary Guard. A 2 plus save makes them okay durability already, adding a 5 plus fill no pain to that seems great, and getting their melee back to an AP of minus 3 with those blades seems nice as well, particularly on top of all the other nice Blood Angels things that they can get. You can also double him up with a Captain or Chapter Master as well, you could potentially have him in this squad with Dante too. Speaking of which, we're moving into the Blood Angels named characters now, and first up we do have the man himself, Commander Dante, with his shiny new model. The Lord Regent of the Imperium Nihilus can join the Assault Squad with Jump Packs, Sanguinary Guard, or Vanguard Veterans, and for the most part his damage and defence is really quite similar. 8 attacks at Strength 7, damage 2 in melee, a 2 plus save with his Artificer armour, and a 4 plus invul, though his Petition Pistol has been changed a little bit. Only 6 inch range now, and more like an old style Inferno pistol, but it does have sustained hits D3 to trade out for the beam rule for that. Still more of a nice to have than his main focus, I think. In terms of his buffs, he seems like a pretty excellent leader for a unit of Sanguinary Guard. Gives them a plus one to charge, which is just nice full stop. Could be good with Deep Strike for an 8 inch charge if you really want to gamble. And he also gives the unit that he's leading a plus one to hit with range and melee. Really good on any combat unit that he leads. Again, the Sanguinary Guard will like it. In combat, his death mask now hands out fight phase battle shock at minus one leadership. Could be helpful to stop the opponent doing a key command reroll or an interrupt. He does seem fairly combat focused though. Unlike Marius Kalgar or Azrael, it doesn't look like he farms command points like his contemporary chapter masters. Overall, I think he seems pretty solid though. A bit of extra combat in himself, boosted melee for his squad, and delivering them to the charge that little bit easier. The other named Golden Angel character is the Sanguinor. He's going to be working as a lone operative without any requirements for positioning, so your opponent just can't shoot him outside of 12 inches at all. And he remains with a fairly similar profile to Dante, but one pip less of strength with his blade, though he does have devastating wounds. His big trick is still that ability to basically appear out of nowhere and try and save the day. Against an enemy army with a bunch of combat units, I feel like you want to put him in reserve. And then when they make a charge against your army, he gets to basically appear unbidden from nowhere. He simply gets to set up an engagement range with the squad that made the charge on your unit. And then he'll be the one who gets to be selected first to fight as well, as he has the fight's first special rule baked into his datasheet. Means that you can just surprise one of your opponent's charging units with 8 attacks at that strength 6 and damage 2. Should be enough to hack down most of a squad of space marines though it still might not be the most help in the world if your opponent has charged you with something truly overwhelming, and they're just going to survive those attacks and go on to kill stuff anyway. Otherwise, he helps out another little bit with a reroll leadership aura too. That could be helpful for helping with some battle shock, though perhaps doesn't feel quite as cool as that intervention mechanic. Next up, we've got Chief Librarian Mephiston, the only one to have conquered the Black Rage. He can lead the Assault Intercessor Squad, Intercessor Squad, and Stern Guard veterans, Though I must admit this perhaps isn't the best selection in the world, I really would have hoped that he could have lead Blade Guard. Just seems that kind of odd that a bunch of these special characters can lead the Stern Guard, but not the Blade Guard that actually specialise in combat on the front line. Fury of the Ancient is his psychic power. It does seem a touch underwhelming to me, to be honest. Three attacks hitting at strength 4 and damage 3 3 on the safe mode, going up to three attacks at strength 5, AP 2 and damage D3 on overcharge, which I think is only borderline worth doing. I guess he does get to back that up with his plasma pistol at least. His melee is still decent enough, strength 9 and damage d3 with 6 attacks. 
And then for his buffing Psychic powers, he'll give the squad a bit of defence with his Psychic Hood. He gets the new version of Quickening to give his squad the fight's first ability. And then he gets Transfixing Gaze as a melee debuff to the enemy. Roll a dice and on a 2+, plus, they get to worsen their weapon skill by 1. And on a 6, they worsen their attacks by 1 as well. He does seem like really quite a solid support character for a melee squad. He could be interesting in an Assault Intercessor squad potentially. Or I suppose could join the Death Company Intercessors as well. I suppose they'd have a little bit more close combat punch than the regular ones. Next up, we've got the two Jump Chaplains, Astarath the Grim and Lamartes. Both of these are being very Death Company focused. They can only lead the Death Company Space Marines with the Jump Packs, and they can't lead things like Sanguinary Guard or Vanguard Veterans. His melee profile has been toned down a little. The Executioner's Axe is now only damage 2, but admittedly does gain devastating wounds, so it's not all bad. And he helps his Death Company out in a few different ways. He'll make sure that they aren't getting the debuff from being too far away from chaplains, so it gives them a bit more objective control and flexibility. He allows them to fight on death on a 4+, plus when models are killed, and once per game he can soup them up with devastating wounds after charging. Really quite brutal if it was combined with Oath of Moment, maybe. Certainly doesn't seem too bad. If you're playing against a very melee heavy opponent, then the fighting in combat death could be quite nice. The devastating wounds is pretty cool as well. I guess that would mean that you'd probably use the Power Fists instead of the Thunder Hammers. After the two though, my first impression is that I quite like Lamartes. Also fairly fighting in combat with his Blood Crozius, Strength 6, AP 2, Damage 2 and Lethal Hits. And then he buffs his unit with two different rules. Minus 1 to the damage of the unit, so solid extra defence between that and the Feel No Pain. And also Lethal Hits for the Death Company as well. Really not bad to have, whether they've got Power Fists or Power Weapons. Should make them a lot more general purpose against high toughness targets. Overall, I think he looks pretty solid. Both the Jump Chaplains do seem nice, though I'd say Lamartes is my favourite from first impressions, obviously depending on points for final judgement. Brother Corbulo is the named Sanguinary Priest. He again can join Devastator squads if he wants to, as well as the other ones that Sanguinary Priests can. He's a tiny bit better in melee than regular Priests, but not by a whole load. Strength 5 and AP minus 1, and he gives the unit the same 5 plus feel no pain. Otherwise though, his secondary buff, he trades extra AP for plus 1 attacks. I'd say that's likely to be a little bit better than extra AP most of the time, though it does depend on what he's leading and what their target is. If he costs around about the same as the Sanguinary Priest, could be a pretty interesting alternative. The Sanguinary Priest could be fairly interesting though in terms of giving them enhancements if you wanted to, either from the Gladius or the Sanguinary one. Next up, Tycho and Death Company Tycho have both received interesting new rules, despite being a model that's been fluff dead for really quite a long time, and not produced by Games Workshop for a little while as well. Non-Black Rage Tycho can attach to Assault Squads, Command Squads, Tactical Squads, or Vanguard Veterans on foot, and obviously you can only have one or the other in the army, not both. Bloodsong, his combi weapon, has got an interesting collection of keywords. It gets two attacks out to 24 inches, Strength 4, AP-1 and Damage 2. And then interestingly enough, it combines Anti-Infantry 4+, plus Devastating Wounds and Melter 2 all on one weapon, weirdly meaning that it's probably best off against Infantry despite being Melter. And I think it basically boils down to 4 Mortal Wounds on a 4+, plus versus Infantry at half range. And it's a fairly decent shooting attack to be honest, I think that's enough to be kind of meaningful extra damage in the squad. He also helps out a more ranged squad as well by giving their attacks either Assault, Heavy or Rapid Fire. Kind of fun to see Rapid Fire applies to certain powerful weapons. I guess maybe it's not too surprising he can't lead Devastators, otherwise he could have Rapid Fire Missile launches to 24 inches. I guess he can have one of those in the tactical squad at least. His melee with the Dead Man's Hand isn't enormously powerful. It gives you 6 attacks, hitting it at 2+, plus, Strength 4, AP-1 and Damage 2. Maybe a reasonable chance to kill a Space Marine. Though interestingly enough, if he gets attacked at all at any point, then it goes up to a fairly respectable 12 attacks. That'll actually have him be quite a serious force against hordes at least, even if he's not going to be able to punch down any particularly tough stuff. I feel like the tactical squad or the command squad could be one of the most interesting things for him. I still feel like he's probably going to be a bit of a weird in-between Blood Angels character, perhaps not really playing to the strengths of the faction with all the ranged things going on. Otherwise, you've also got the option for Tycho on a bad day. He can only lead the Death Company Space Marines, so not the more standard Blood Angels. He trades his leadership abilities for the Black Rage, the ability to help the on-foot Death Company advance and charge, which is really quite a big deal, and kind of nice to actually deliver the on-foot version into combat if you choose to go for them over the jump pack ones. Perhaps the most fun thing about him, though, is that when he's slain in melee, he has the Death Vision of Sanguinius special rule. It basically makes him go off like a mortal wound bomb in melee. Roll a d6. On a 2 to 3, the enemy takes 3 mortal wounds. On a 4 or 5, you get d3 plus 3. And on a 6, he gets a d6 plus 3. 
even gets a plus two to this roll if the attacking unit contains the enemy warlord, really quite a massive chance of handing out a spectacular amount of mortal wounds there. I suppose that is something that your opponent would see coming, and probably trying to avoid killing him in melee if at all possible, though sometimes it might not always be in their control if he charges something big and nasty. Finally, we have the one special character who's not from the Blood Angels proper, Gabriel Seth of the Flesh Terrors still appears to be in the book, despite again having his model removed from Games Workshop's web store. As a first born marine, he can either lead assault squads, command squads, tactical squads, or vanguard veterans. Maybe the command squad could be an interesting one out of those. He basically brings a whole bunch of general purpose melee damage, six attacks at strength eight, AP two, and damage three with sustained hits. His whirlwind of gore, rather than giving him fights again, just adds plus one to the attacks for every five models within six inches. A bit less powerful than it was, but damage three is still quite nice on a character. Like Death Company Tycho as well, he also gives the squad the ability to advance and charge. Again, that could be quite nice on the command squad, as they give you plus one to advance and to charge with the champion. Means that on average, a Gabriel Seth command squad unit would have an average charge threat range of around about 18 or 19 inches, which really isn't bad for on-foot infantry. As a Flesh Terrors model, you can't take him alongside the other Blood Angels epic heroes. Basically, you have the choice of him or the choice of any of the other epic hero ones. You can't have both. With the named characters done, that basically brings us to the end of the Blood Angel Index review, and our first look as to how the Sons of Sanguinius will be playing in 10th. Overall, I don't feel that they've made out too badly, perhaps. I think they're still going to have a very unique feel within the Space Marine army, perhaps in no small part due to being basically the only chapter now who's got some seriously dangerous jump infantry. The regular Marines only have the Assault Squad and Vanguard veterans, both of which are slightly lacking in their own ways. The Sanguinary Guard and the Death Company just feel far elevated from those, though I'm sure they'll cost a few more points to represent that. Red Thirst and the occasional command point for Red Rampage should feel really nice on any standard melee units out of the Codex, they'll just hit so much harder in Blood Angels. It might just be a bit harder to get them there, given the plus one to advance and charge being removed, and losing the Ancient's unique jump pack relic. Data sheet power is obviously not going to be too clear till we have the points. From the squads, I feel like the Death Company and Sanguinary Guard are still looking very interesting. Surprisingly, out of the vehicles, maybe the Death Company Dreadnought could be cool. He moves a bit faster and has that very interesting counter-attack type rule, which seems very powerful if the opponent isn't careful. And the Librarian Dreadnought seems pretty nice for jumping other units around the board. Out of the character data sheets, I like the Sanguinary Priest for his 5 plus feel no pain. Dante and the Sanguinor both seem nice. And I quite like the idea of Lamartis leading a Death Company unit with a minus 1 damage and lethal hits. He just seems like a lot of good value. I'll be interested to hear your takes though. What are you making of the Index Blood Angels as they stand at the moment? And what sort of army could you see yourself playing with them in 10th? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. Or I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Auspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you're interested in helping support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.